Life. And we are Tim and Tammy Leathers, um, and we are the founders of Lifehouse. We are U.S. missionaries, and we, um, we're missionaries. I just, I, I was, Pastor Todd and I was talking, I said, I just can't get over the fact that we are missionaries. We have loved missions. Every, I, my dad was a pastor, so I loved it when the missionaries came and had the table set up with all the knickknacks and track and stuff on there. And missions has always been close to our heart. And God has called us to, uh, to have a ministry. We are the founders of uh, a home for ladies that are struggling with life controlling issues. And uh, after 17 and a half years of pastoral ministry and also being the chief of police, um, God called us to give that all up and to go full time as missionaries. And we've done that uh, two years ago. Um, we we went, became missionaries January 1 and then COVID hit in March, so great timing there, but God was, has been faithful, and uh, so we want, to, we want to share a little bit about, about um, Lifehouse with you, and I want to introduce my beautiful wife, Tammy. Good morning. It's so good to be here this morning. We've been anticipating, we've known about coming here for quite a little while now, and it seemed far off, and here we are, so um, I want to introduce you to someone uh, this morning, and if we put the first... Uh, slide up here. This is Lauren. Lauren grew up as an only child into a home that um, had severe mental health issues in her in her home. And she saw a lot of things in her life that she shouldn't have had to see as, see as a child. And they did, she didn't grow up knowing that much about Jesus. And she grew up uh, becoming an introvert. And that letter when she got into school to hang out with other students that really wasn't healthy for her. And by the time she was 11 years old, she was experimenting with marijuana. And by the time she was 14, she was already doing meth. By the time she was 18, she had her first arrest, which led her to many arrests after that. In her early 20s, she already had two boys, and she had a boyfriend who she was in her, her, uh, his apartment. He knew what was going to happen. She didn't. He left her with her two boys in the apartment, and a police raid happened. And the police came in with guns pointing at her and her boys and arrested her. And um, they told her, gave her grace, and they said, Lauren, get your life together. You have two beautiful boys. And they released her, but the hold of her substance abuse was too much on her, and she went right back to it and ended up in prison. Um, one point, and this is a statistics from 2016, 1.9 million women were released from prison or jails in 2016. Research makes clear that women returning home from prison have a significantly higher need for services than men. And the reason why is women who can't secure safe housing may return to abusive partners or family situation for housing and financial reasons. According to reports, interventions should provide safe, respectful environment, promote healthy relationships, address substance use, trauma, and mental health issues, provide women with opportunities to improve their socioeconomic conditions, establish comprehensive and collaborative community services, and prioritize women's empowerment and provide help for family reunification. Well, this is what LifeHouse provides. This is our mission statement. LifeHouse exists to provide an encouraging and safe environment to empower women on a journey to seek improvement in their health and give them hope and freedom from strongholds through education and spiritual direction so they can find their purpose through Christ and live a productive and addiction-free life. Now, there's something in there that the first thing didn't talk about, and that's Jesus Christ, because we know that hope only comes through Jesus Christ, and we know that the only way that they can become victorious in their life is through Jesus. And that song about champions, that's what we want to see in these women's life, is them to become champions and addiction-free and victorious through their life, and we know that comes through the power of Jesus Christ. The relapse and overdose rate has increased by 30% since March 2020, because what happened in 2020? COVID. COVID, yes. Mental health issues related to the pandemic are especially hard for people with depression and anxiety, and we have seen a, a real upcrease. We have a wait list right now of women wanting to come into LifeHouse because it is so bad right now. But we do have hope, and this next slide shows Lauren now. This is Lauren with her boys. When she came to LifeHouse, she hadn't seen or talked to her boys in two and a half years. Since she has come to LifeHouse, she has renewed that relationship with her boys. The next slide shows her. 
Um, Lauren is a worshiper. She loves Jesus with her whole heart, and she loves to worship him. Um, she is our first graduate from LifeHouse. She lives at LifeHouse with us still. She helps us at LifeHouse. She has a job, and she loves doing her job outside of LifeHouse as well, but she still helps us within, and she loves living with us. Her boys come and stay with us from time to time, and um, she loves being a mama, and they love her with all their heart. Uh, the next slide shows us in front of our home, we were able to... Up oh. Oh, it, oh, I forgot about this slide. Yes, this is a slide of our current girls that we have with us right now. Um, wonderful group of girls that have been with us. Um, the, uh, we have many of, a couple of them that are just going into phase three and looking for a job. And so they are in it for the long haul. And we're excited about these women. The next slide is the home that we were able to obtain a couple years ago now. Uh, we've done some work to it. It looks a little bit better than it does now. Um, this has nine bedrooms seven and a half bathrooms, because you know women need bathrooms. So we're excited about um, how much room we have in this house and how, how we can fill it. Uh, the next picture shows Tim and I in front of the house because we love our house, so we took a picture of us in front of it. <laughs> we pro provide 24 hours, seven day a week care. Tim and I live with the women 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We make sure, help us learn. <laughs> That's because we have to live with him. No, just kidding. We, <laughs> we make sure that each resident gets the physical, mental, and spiritual help she needs. We can take up to 12 women. Right now, we do not because we are not fully funded. We are at 61% of our budget. We're hoping to get fully funded so that we can take in more women. Um, we, the cost is $25 per woman per day. That is a bargain because we are not only touching one woman we are touching the lives of the, their children and their generations to come. Because we didn't just touch Lauren. We're touching her boys as well so that we can break that cycle of addiction in their life as well. What do we charge? Zero. We do not charge these women anything to come into our program. We rely on the donations of churches and individuals and civic, civic groups and businesses to help us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, something that we do, we, we feel very uh, passionate that education is important for us to help train these ladies. So a lot of them don't have any uh, skills. A lot of them have never even had jobs before. So we want them to, when they leave LifeHouse, to be able to go and support themselves. And so a few things we're doing. This is a picture of our aquaponics greenhouse. If you don't know what aquaponics is, we have these great big vats full of tilapia fish. We have about 1,000 tilapia fish right now. They're all about like this, perfect size to eat. But we're not eating them because we want them to poop in the water. <laughs> Sorry, that's exactly what they do. And we take that water and we pump that into the greenhouse, and this is what we get right here. This is our first harvest of lettuce that we grew. This is one of the girls holding. You see the roots hanging down. The lettuce grows five times faster in, in aquaponics water than it does in soil, and uh, aquaponics is a really niche type of a program. It's, it's totally organic. Uh, we eat a lot of lettuce and things like that, and we will, t we will be taking it to um, farmer's markets and selling it, and it'll be another outreach for us for, for LifeHouse, and we're teaching the ladies how to run a business, how to do everything from uh, starting up a business to bookkeeping, planting, harvesting, packaging, sell selling, uh, marketing, all the things that, that have to do with this. is a picture of our fish and our big vats with tilapia. And they, we tell, like I said, you can see the water there is perfect, uh, perfectly nitrogen. Uh, we have bacteria that causes everything to grow. It's really neat. Look it up on YouTube. Lots of great videos. And something that we want to do with aquaponics is we want other missionaries to come to LifeHouse, stay with us. We are going to teach them how to do, do aquaponics aquaponics, and then they can take aquaponics or hydroponics, which is just instead of using fish, you're using uh, fertilizer in water. Take that back to a third world country, start a, a, um, a co-op in those communities with missionaries, start feeding people who are starving uh, for nutritious food, and then give them the gospel for spiritual food. And our hope is uh, uh, missions trips, churches like you, we would jump on and go like we did to, to El Salvador, go over there, help um, to set up this aquaponics or hydroponics system, and then our goal is to leave one of our ladies there as a missionary associate with those missionaries and to see what God can do through them. And, uh, and so it, that's one of the neat things. This is a, a picture of our, um, uh, well, it's a likeness of the building. We're getting ready to build. It's our education building. Uh, one of the important things is for us to teach the ladies how to support themselves. Because if they come to us and they don't have a place to go when they leave, 
a lot of times they'll go back to where they came from, back to relationships, back into bad uh, situations. So we want to train them um, in this brand new building that we're getting ready to build. We, our goal for 2021 was to raise $50,000, and we did that. We had, we had a church that gave us $53,000 to build this education building. We are going to be teaching the ladies how to be welders. Because ladies make incredible welders. Every time I say that, I have someone come up and go, man, I work with a bunch of lady welders, and they're awesome. I talked with a guy that's a big wig in a, in a major corporation, and he said, my lady welders are my better welders than the men. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. amen. And a woman can do anything she wants to set her mind to. Um, they can make about $35 an hour with all the benefits. So uh, I've, I've mentioned this in another church. I had a gentleman came up to me, and he said, I, I just want you to know I just retired from John Deere. I was in charge of welding for John Deere. I'm a welding instructor, and I want to be a part of LifeHouse. And so <laughs> we were at another church. Soon as, I mean, as soon as, as they prayed at the end, Tammy and I took off to go to the table. This, late, this girl comes running up. She's about 26 years old. She said, I'm a welding instructor. I teach other ladies how to weld, and I want to be a part of LifeHouse. That's how God is providing. And uh, so we're excited about that. We're going to be building that by the fall, and uh, we're excited to see what God is going to do through that. And um, I do want to jump really quickly into the Word of God this morning. Uh, we do ask you a couple of things. Uh, stop by our table. We have candy, free candy out there. Help yourself. Fill up your pockets, that type of stuff. Werther's. Worthers, can I get an amen for Worthers, amen? And, uh, I, and, grab, um, and also we have a newsletter. If you would like to receive a newsletter, we can either send a, a copy in the mail or we can send an email copy, whichever one you would prefer. All you have to do is sign up for it. It's free of charge. We have prayer cards back there, folks. We can't do without prayer. Because I tell you what, the devil doesn't want us to do what we're doing. The devil does not want, I mean, he does not want to see these people and ladies set free from addiction. Because he knows if, if they get set free from their addiction, they're going to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. So we have prayer cards. If you put this on your refrigerator, put it in your Bible, maybe the place you pray, just remember to pray for LifeHouse and these, these wonderful ladies that we get to minister to. And also we have a, a brochure. We want to be a resource for your church. Pastor, we want to be a resource for you. When someone comes to you and says, hey, my daughter's struggling with addiction, the pastor says, I know exactly who to call. We had that happen just, just about two months ago. Pastor called us within 48 hours. That girl was in our home. That lady was in our home living there and is doing, matter of fact, the lady you've seen holding the lettuce while ago, doing it incredible. Her parents came and seen her. She'd only been there for two months. They walked in, didn't hardly recognize their own daughter, how, how much she had healed. So it's just, it's incredible. We can tell you testimony after testimony of what God has done. And um, we're excited about that because statistically they say that 48% of everyone in the United States knows someone who is struggling with addiction either a relative, a co-worker, a family member, a neighbor. That's half of the people in this room right now know someone struggling with addiction. So the need is great. And um, a place like LifeHouse, because the only thing that's going to get people out of their addiction is Jesus Christ. The government programs don't work. They try it. They have about a 3% success rate. And um, so Jesus Christ is the answer. And I do want to talk about that this morning because there's a portion of Scripture. Let's go on to this slide. here. Uh, I love this slide here. And I, I can't even sit and look at it because it chokes me up because this is the definition of missions right here. You see the missionary that's waded out into the water to grab that lost lamb, to pull that, that precious lamb to safety. But you see that missionary can't do it without churches like you to stand behind them. As a matter of fact, missions is so biblical that, that Jesus said right before he was ascended to heaven, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospels. And how can someone go unless they are sent? Scripture talks about that. And your church standing behind missionaries is sending them out in the mission fields. Because you see, if the missionaries aren't there to go, guess who has to go? You. If there wasn't missionaries that's willing to go to Botswana and around the world, then, then someone here has to go. And, uh, but you guys are the kind of church that does this right here, joining hand in hand with the missionaries. And we thank you for that. For the, all the missionaries that you support, thank you for your faithfulness so they can stay on the mission field. And uh, I do want to get in the word this morning. Uh, real quickly, there's a portion of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that I want us to look at this morning. This portion of scripture plagued me when I was pa a pastor. And uh, this portion of scripture really talks explicitly about where we are today in the world that we live in today. And here's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. It says, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. 
Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let, light, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Spirit of God, may your word pierce our hearts deeply. God, I pray today that your word would go so deep, not just into our soul, but God, may it penetrate our spirits today. Father, may it be tattooed upon our hearts. Father, may we truly hear from you. May we not be distracted of the things today, but God, speak to us in these next few minutes, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. This scripture is talked about in quite a few places in the scripture. It's talking about this veil that is over the faces of people who don't know Christ. I, every time we watch a, a movie where someone's being kidnapped, you know, they're walking down the street and all of a sudden the van comes up, slides up by them. Two people jump out. What's the first thing they do? They throw a, a veil over their heads so they can't see where they're going. And they throw them into the van and they're kidnapped. And that is a perfect picture of what the scripture is talking about, that people have this veil over their faces and they cannot see the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. As we were sitting worshiping a minute ago, I thought about these new houses right over here. I thought there's people sitting there. This morning, they're sitting at tables with holes in their hearts. They're looking. They're, they're, they're sitting there going, I get, there's got to be more. And just within a few hundred or a few thousand feet was a church going on with exactly what they were looking for this morning that would fill that hole. And that hole could only be filled with Jesus Christ because they've got this veil over their eyes. They don't see the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. And it's important you would think, okay, so how is that veil going to be lifted off their eyes? I mean, a lot of times we, the churches, say, well, you know, uh, this world's just growing worse. So even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I just want to be raptured out of here. I just want to go home because I don't want to be in this world anymore because of what the sin that's going on. But you see, as long as we are on this earth, as long as Christ tarries, as long as God sets back and waits before he tells his son, go get your bride, someone has got to help lift the veil off of these blind people. Is, is it going to happen just naturally? No. Is it, is, is, it, is it going to happen through a TV evangelist? Probably not. Maybe one or two then how is this veil going to be lifted off their eyes? Number one, the world is blind to God's love. They don't know about that Jesus loved them so much, that God loved them so much that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Number two, point number two is this. Satan has blinded them. Satan wants to keep this world blind to the good news of Jesus Christ because Satan knows once they begin to hear, once they begin to feel, once they begin to, to, to experience how much God loves them, it begins to pull in their heart. That, that void inside their life begins to, to, to start being filled and they start saying, I, I, I want what you have. Point number three, God's love must be in us. You see, I believe what this world needs is not another explanation of Jesus. They need a demonstration of Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? I believe our world is sick and tired of demonstrations of Jesus. Someone standing on the corner with a placard on their chest that says, turn or burn. And in our, in our little town, there's a guy, they, every time we have a festival or anything in our town, they want to stand on the corner and tell people as they walk by, they're all going to hell because they have a tattoo or their hair was too long or, or, or whatever. And they'll, they'll sit there and, and condemn people saying, you're going, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And now when I was a chief of police, people would go, you need to get that guy off the corner from doing that. And I said, I can't because it's freedom of speech. And I had city councilmen come and you need to remove them. And I, I couldn't do it unless we wanted to be sued. They had the, they had the right, according to us living here in the United States. 
But the problem was their, their philosophy was wrong because they, 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 they're not going to hell until they draw their last breath and have not called upon the name of Jesus Christ. As long as they have breath in their, I told him that, it says, as long as they got breath in their body and they're not on their way to hell until they've drawn their last breath because there's still time, there's still mercy, there's still grace that's available to them if they will call upon the name. But how are they going to call upon the name of the Lord unless somebody tells them, unless someone demonstrates them how much Jesus Christ loves them. And you see, God's love must be seen in us. Number four is God's love must be seen through us. This is what I'm talking about. That demonstration of God's love must be so evident in our lives that when people look at us, they say, you know what? I want what you got. I want to know this joy that you have on Monday morning when you go to work, that smile on your face, that song upon your heart. I want what you got because you see my alcohol's not working. My drug of choice isn't working. I'm, I need an answer. And it seems like you've got what I'm looking for. Can you tell me about Jesus Christ? Can you you tell me about what you've got. You see, God's love must be seen through us because this world is blind and their, it's their, their life is veiled to, to, to the love of Jesus Christ. And how's that veil going to be ripped off unless somebody tells them unless they see, hear, and feel the love of Jesus Christ. You see, that's the great thing about the Holy Spirit. As we begin to work and motivate in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to work not only just in us, but he begins to work through us to touch someone who desperately needs to hear and to see and to feel the love of Jesus Christ. You see, this, all around us this morning are people that are looking for the answer that happens right inside this place every Sunday. They're looking for something that will fill the void. They're looking for something that will shine light into their dark world. You see, the scripture we read earlier talked about this light that needs to shine into this dark world. You remember the song we used to sing when we were in Sunday school, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine. How many remember that song? Remember that song? You know, hide under, under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. But how many times we as Christians, we hide that light under our bushel and we don't let our light shine in our workplace, in our school place, in our community, in our neighborhood, in our civil and social clubs that we're in. That we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. We keep him bottled up inside and just like a, just like a trophy that, that causes us that when I die, I'm not going to go to hell because I have Jesus in my heart. And it's got to be more than that because, you see, Jesus was so excited when he began to tell his disciples. He, he, here's the way I believe Jesus did it. I, I believe Jesus said this, guys, it's expedient that I go away. Because, you see, if I don't go away, the comforter's not going to come. The third person in the Trinity. We've got our, we've got our Father God. We've got me, Jesus, the Savior of the world. But also, there's that third person that's, a, that's in high regard, not just the lowest part of the Godhead, but equal with God, who is God, and his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He said, unless I go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And he told him to go and wait until that, till that coming of the Holy Spirit happens. We know that happened in the second, uh, the second chapter of the book of Acts, this outpouring. We believe in that, don't we, church? There's a lot of churches that don't believe in that this morning because I tell you what, that's uncontrollable. We like to have a controllable religion. We like to have a controllable God. But see, we believe that the power of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus said this to his disciples, he said, greater works are you going to do because the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the Holy Spirit's not going to just work in you, but he's going to begin to work through you. That you can be a light in this dark world. The scripture says that if we lift up Jesus Christ, it will draw people to him. That we need to be, and he said this, he said, you are the light of the world. You, you're the one that carries the light to this community. You are the one that carries the light to, to, to this lost world, to those people that this morning that are all around us that are searching for the good news. You carry the light into your school, into your workplace. Tomorrow, if, if you were go to work tomorrow and you're, you're in your office or on that factory line or whatever you do, and all of a sudden the announcement happened like, so, can I have your attention, please? All Christians, please come to the office at this time. All Christians, please come to the office. So what you do, you get up from your workplace or you start going, would people go, oh, oh no way, you're, you're, you're a Christian? I did not know that. I got a Christian t-shirt too. 
If that announcement happened, would people look right at you and go, well, I know they're going to go because they demonstrate Jesus Christ all the time, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's popular, but, but I know they're a Christian because, because not because they don't do this, or they don't do that. they're a Christian because it's evident in their life. You see, tomorrow at your workplace, at your school, you're not going to say, hey, Pastor Todd, I want you to come at lunchtime. We have lunch at 1130. Come to, come to lunch with me in the lunchroom. And you're in the lunchroom and you say, oh, excuse me, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? My Pastor Todd is here and he's going to tell you about Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Todd. It's all yours. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. You see, if they're going to hear about Jesus Christ, it's probably not going to happen through Pastor Todd unless they've watched through through the media of of a computer or television. They're going to hear through you. And if not you, then who? Then who? That family member who doesn't know Jesus Christ, that neighbor, that best friend, that coworker, those people that, that are in your life every day, if they don't hear and see and feel Jesus Christ through you, then through, is Billy Graham going to come and, and, and preach to him? Is some of TV evangelists going to come through the TV and probably zap them and get, probably not. If not you, then through who? Because here's where the rubber meets the road, church. If they don't know Jesus Christ before they draw their last breath, then they'll be separated from God forever and ever in a place called hell that was never meant for them, wasn't designed for them. But you see, we serve a holy and a righteous God where sin cannot be in his presence. And by his love and his mercy that he loved us so much that he gave his only son as a substitute for us. We don't have to die for our sins. You see, Jesus died once and once and for all. That all we have to do is accept that free gift. If I was standing here this morning, and I don't even know how long I've been going because my, my clock stopped. Uh, anyway, um, if I was standing here this morning with a package, a beautiful package with a bow, and I was to ha- if I was to call you up here and I said, hey, whatever your name is, hey, Tom, I got a, I got a, I got a gift for you. This, this gift is for you. You can walk up here, Tom or Susie, whatever your name is, and you can look at that gift and you can say, nah, I don't believe I want that gift. I, I probably have one like it at home, so I, I, I don't really. Now, if you, accept, if you offer that gift to me when I'm an 80, I'll, I might accept it then, but right now, I, I don't believe I, I need that gift today. You see, that's the gift of salvation that is offered to everyone but they've got to be in a place where the gift can be offered. They've got to be drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that happens through you and I. Because you see, we are the ones that carry the light. I want to tell a story as I close this morning. When I was a, a young kid, I grew up in Missouri. And, and at sixth grade, we went to the Bon Terre Mine. The Bon Terre Mine was a lead mine. It's closed. They no longer lead, uh, you know, mine lead out of there. It's now just a tourist place. And we went, the whole school went, we got off the bus. We went, we went down into this, 300 feet into this mine. And we walked into this big room called the Cathedral Room. This room was probably 30 or 40 times larger than this room. It, the ceilings were probably 40, 50 feet tall. There was a river that ran through there and the lights were in the water. It was beautiful, spring-fed water. And we're inside this cathedral room and the room had such uh, uh, acoustics that people used to go and record albums down in there. It was just this beautiful place. And as we were standing in the cathedral room, our, our tour guide said this. He goes, in just a minute, I'm going to do something. I'm going to turn the lights off inside this mine. He said, now you've never experienced darkness like you're about ready to experience. He said, now don't body move around. As soon as you try to stand where you're, where you're standing because we don't want anybody to fall into, the, into the, the, the lake. He said, just stand there. And he said, put your hand in front of your face. And he said, you won't even be able to see your hand in front of your face. And he goes, okay, get ready. And all of a sudden the lights went click, click, click and they began to go off. And all of a sudden we were standing in this dark room 300 feet below the ground. And it was so dark in that room, you could feel the dark. He said, he said, you, he said, you could almost feel the darkness, can't you? It was so, it was a heaviness in that room. The darkness was pressing in on us. You couldn't, there was not a light anywhere. Your eyes could not adjust to, to make out anything except blackness. And all of a sudden, we didn't realize that our, our tour guide had wandered off about 30 to 40 feet away. And he took a lighter and he lit a candle in that room. Just one 
little candle inside that huge auditorium of a room. And all of a sudden, our eyes drew, was drawn to the light. All of a sudden, with that one little candle, you could begin to make out the faces around you. The, the, you could begin to make out the water that was, the, the, the light was glistening off the water. And all of a sudden, as your eyes began to adjust, you could see the stalactites and the stalagmites in the room. And just by that one small light dispelled the heavy darkness in that room. And even, even as a young person, I thought that's what Jesus is talking about, that we are to be in the light to this dark world. You see, so many times we think, well, my little light's not going to do much. But you see, when we allow the Holy Spirit begin to work through us, Scripture says that light dispels the darkness. Just like that candle in that mind that day totally displaced the darkness and we could begin to see faintly the people that were around us. That's what Christ is asking each one of us to do is for us to go into our world and be that light in a dark world. Because you know, no matter how great the darkness is, no matter how great the sin that abounds out there, the light will dispel the darkness. Because greater is he that's within you than he that's within this world. And you see, that's what the world is looking for, someone that will just light a light in their dark world so they can just see faintly, so they can begin to hear, so they can begin to see and begin to feel the love of Jesus Christ. You see, this morning I want to ask a question in this room. And, I, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I, I would guarantee that everyone will identify with the question I'm going to ask is how many of us have one person in our life who desperately needs to know Jesus Christ. Just one person, one family member, one friend. Maybe it's one of your children. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your husband or your wife. Maybe it's your coworker. Maybe it's your fishing buddy. Maybe it's that person you go shopping with. That one person that you know that unless they call upon the name of Jesus Christ, they're not going to make it to heaven. Unless... They ask Jesus to come into their heart and to be their Lord and Savior. The only place that they can go is outer darkness without God. And as you think about that one person, because I'm thinking about my one person right now that I think about every time I bring this message, that it breaks my heart that my friend doesn't know Jesus Christ. And I want to see him come to know Jesus. It's been my goal for over 17 years for this one friend of mine to come to know Jesus Christ. And each one of us in this room this morning know one person who desperately needs to know the love of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask, if, if you're not demonstrating that love to them, who's going to do it? If you're not demonstrating the love of, if they don't see Jesus Christ in you, then who will they see Jesus in? You see, here's what I believe God wants to do this morning. is for each one of us to have just one person in our life that we say God lay that person so heavily upon my heart that I, it, I wake up in the night thinking about them I wake up times just tears running onto my pillow hurting because they don't know you God lay them so heavily upon my heart I'm not I'm not talking about the 50 or 100 people out here that don't God I'm just asking you for that this is one person because I love them so much and I know that you love them just lay, God I, I, I want to have a passion for them because you see what passion is passion is that thing that causes you to lay awake at night and what causes you to weep golf is probably not your passion fishing is probably not your passion uh, crocheting is probably not your passion because that probably never well playing golf can make you weak sorry about that but uh, anyway but you see passion is that thing that causes us to weep and for us to have that one person who doesn't know Jesus Christ let me tell you what happens if each one of us in this room this morning just reach one in this year just one one person for the cause of Christ. You know what happens? You can't have church here anymore because now your church is doubled. Let's say that there's, there's let's just say there's a hundred people in here and every hundred people would reach just one person for the cause of Christ. Next year, your church is 200. And if those 200 people that next year just have one person that God lays on their heart, that they reach them, that they minister to them, that they pray for them, that they, they take them to dinner, they have them over, they go fishing, they do all those kind of things, and they come to know Jesus Christ next year, now you've got a church of 400. 
And if those 400 people would just reach one person for the cause of Christ at, in that one year, the next year your church is 800. And if, and if those 800 would reach just one person for the cause of Christ the next year, the church is 1,600. You see, that's what Jesus said. Go and add to the church daily. I, but I, I just wonder, I, I just wonder, I'm going to say it. I wonder if Jesus didn't make a mistake when he said go in and add to the church. I wonder if he didn't mean go multiply to the church daily. Because you see, there's something about addition that turns into multiplication. We, we love multiplication when it comes to our 401ks and things like that, compound interest. You see, I believe that's what we need to have happen in the church. I believe, I believe that's what needs to happen. Because you see, if each one, if each Christian would just reach one, I think it's in like 42 years, the entire world would be reached for the cause of Christ. See, that's what mission's about. That's what the church is about. The church is not about just meeting a few hundred people every Sunday. It's about reaching those who desperately need to hear and to see and to feel the love of Christ. And if not through you, then through who? I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. Here's what I believe I believe God wants to do this morning. I want to ask everyone just to close their eyes, bow your heads in this really reverent time. As I believe God wants to commission you. Wants to commission you to reach just one. Commission. You see, my wife and I had the honor to be commissioned about a year ago, a year and a half ago, to become missionaries. About two, two and a half months ago, I was commissioned as your pastor, laid his hands upon me as an ordained minister, and I was commissioned to go and preach the gospel. And I believe this morning that the Holy Spirit wants to lay his hands upon you and commission you to just reach one. Just reach one. Each one reach one. You see, I looked at your, your over here, two, 2021, something better. There's something better God has for his church. Something better he has for those loved ones that don't know him. He has something better for those hundreds of people right now that are sitting in their living rooms or at their coffee tables, at their kitchen tables, longing for something that will change their life. And how will their life be changed unless they see, hear, and feel the love of Jesus Christ from someone who knows Jesus Christ? If you're in this room this morning, no one's looking around, every eye is closed, and God has laid one soul upon your heart, I want to ask you to raise your hand this morning. Just hold it there. He's laid one, one soul upon your heart this morning. Just one person who needs to know him. One person who's going to go to hell unless they ask Jesus into their heart. You see, this morning as you've held your hand up, as you're holding your hand up high, God's going to commission you to reach that one person for him. He's going to give you BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals and ideas how to reach them. I, uh, ways of contact, ways of blessing them, ways of, of ministering to them, open doors to, to, to begin to minister to them. And this morning, we're going to pray that God would commission you, that this will not just be a Sunday morning feeling, that truly this person will become a passion upon your heart, that at times you can't sleep, you lay on your bed and you begin to weep for them because you love them so much and you long for them to come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus.